It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Mines. Welcome. My name is Ebuka Obuchi, and thanks a lot for joining us. Um, a good weekend for a lot of Nigerians, especially if you're a sports fan, which a lot of Nigerians have become in the last couple of days uh, because of the Super Eagles. Um, not a lot of cheering news around the country for a while now, so everybody's holding on to that one thing and hoping that the Super Eagles continue to go all the way. The beat Angola uh, by goal to nil on on Friday and we have our next game on Wednesday against South Africa so we're keeping our fingers crossed and hoping that by the next time we're here in Robin Mines we'll be talking about the finals which we'll be holding uh, next Sunday. But well, let's uh, get into um, the show for the day. Nigeria is going through a lot like I said the economy is struggling and um, the unemployment levels are beyond words and a lot of people have tied that to the state of our education here in Nigeria. I'm going to start the conversation today talking about education uh, and what the possibilities are of starting to you know, fix that, whether it's short to medium term, but most importantly long term. We're joined from our Apucha Studios by Molara Akinwoleri. Thanks a lot for joining us. How are you doing? <coughs> How are you doing? I'm very well. <coughs> Thank you so much for How are you me. doing? Thanks a lot for joining us. Now, um, you are the founder of Lara Craft Toys and a director at Judith Preparatory School. So you, you have sort of a uh, hands-on idea of how things are going. Um, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, besides on the one hand, the number of out-of-school children, which is the highest in the world in Nigeria. There's also the talk about the quality for those who are even in school. And, you know, we hear all of these stories about, you know, employers talking about, you know, <laughs> trying to employ people or get people on jobs. And we hear all the stories about um, the qualifications not being as good as they used to be. How bad are things, especially at the foundational level? Because most people will tell you that, you know, that's where things get set. The primary and before you get to the tertiary level, a lot of you know, the soundness of the individual is already formed. Um, what's your take on how things are right now? Okay, yes, it's amazing you talked about education because education is literally the core of everything we do. I have an early years and primary school called Judith Preparatory School. So what we do is just to raise children, not just for the local environment, but for the international environment as well. So we make sure that we raise children from a stage where as they're literally learning to talk, learning to walk, we're teaching them to do things the right way. Usually when it comes to early years, a lot of people sometimes don't play em pay emphasis on that, but it's actually important for us, especially in the Nigerian environment as well, to raise children that are critical thinkers, because when we do that, these children grow up to ask the why questions. You know, they don't see things and just leave them as they are. They ask the why questions, and when they do that, they're actually able to troubleshoot and help us solve so many problems, you know, that we're currently facing. So at the school, we just make sure that we raise children that are critical thinkers and encourage them to be bold, speak up, and just help solve all the problems around as well. Because there's a belief that for a lot of people, you know, back in the day, even when primary education was free and was government run, you know, the foundation was better than now when private institutions sort of have the bulk of, you know, primary education, um, the population of primary education in their care. So is this an indictment on primary education or is it an indictment on government or is that even a fair analysis of things? Well, as a private school owner, I know the things we go through on our end, trying to make sure that we produce children that will literally come up in the economy and just make things better. It's hard for um, a lot of private school owners because we're putting everything that we can. Um, we get support from the government every now and then, but if we could actually get more support, you know, the government, we know they can't do everything on their own. And as private school owners, we go the extra mile to train ourselves, you know, to train the teachers that come into our care. Sometimes you get teachers that, yes, they've graduated with a BSc in education or they have, you know, an educational background, but it's still not up to standard of where we want things to be. So we have to retrain teachers, you know, obviously to make sure that they're training children the right way as well. So, yes, so we have to always retrain every time. I'm very glad that you brought up the teacher conversation there because I think that's been the 
biggest conversation around, you know, public schools in particular. Because whether we like it or not, there can be so many primary, private uh, institutions, but these public schools will always hold the bulk of the Nigerian population because of the state of our economy, you know, whether we like it or not. There's a lot of poverty in the land. Not everybody can afford to send their kids to those uh, private schools. And a lot of conversation goes on around teacher quality. What can we start doing in that regard, if, especially as governments? Because yes, private institutions, on some level, everybody, there's some competition there, so people try to do better. But with the government institutions, what can we start to do to have that conversation around, you know, having better teaching mechanics, if possible? Okay, um, well, for a teacher to be able to pass on the education, they definitely need to know it themselves. First, it starts with how they're able to connect with the children in their care. It starts with, you know, their level of understanding and the exposure they also have. You can't teach what you don't have, you know. So for a government to really be able to um, educate the teachers and the public sector, they also have to be aware of the surroundings. You know, pay attention to what really is the need of the children that these teachers are trying to teach. What's the exposure level of the teachers and how can you also get private schools to help bring these public school teachers up? As um, a school owner myself, I always make sure that I constantly retrain myself. So with the way we grew up, you know, we learned in different ways. Things have evolved since then. I constantly upgrade myself, not just with the educational materials around, but with the technological aspects as well. We have to keep up. We have to look at how technology can also act as enablers to make sure that whether you're in the private sector or you're in the public sector, you're actually up to date in terms of the curriculum and the delivery as well. So government needs to also look at how they can use technology as enablers to help teachers in the, private, in the public sector. We can reach everybody, but technology can be a bridge to making sure that the teachers in the public sector can also have access to what the private schools are using for delivery to. So I, I want to talk about, you know, um, what do you think, I mean, you run a preparatory school, so that's really young, right? Um, and we've, we've seen all of these statistics about the number of out-of-school children across the country. Is there really a point where it becomes, for want of a better phrase, too late to save people, you know, <laughs> to get back into the educational system? Is there an age where you feel like, you know, because... We live in Nigeria, we go around the streets, we see a lot of young men and women just sort of sitting idly. You know, there's talks about that generation already being lost, you know, because we have left it too late for them. You know, how late is too late, you know, to start fixing this education for young people? Okay, it's never too late. No matter the age you are, no matter the children that are out there on the street, I would say it's never too late. And one thing we should always try to put into consideration is that children have different levels of knowledge, they have different skills. So whether they're too old or we feel that, you know, they're young enough, we should actually try to tap into what the children's skills are, what their interests lie in. Not everybody will go down the academic route. So if they don't want to go down the academic route, how else can we make sure that they use their interests to become better citizens? You know, so we have to tap into what the children like. It, they are never too old and it's never too late for someone to learn something new. Technology look like now, especially at that stage, the foundation stages, you know, from let's say three, four, five years old till about early teens, you know, when a lot of the formative years uh, happen. What does technology look like, especially in a place like Nigeria where, you know, we are not necessarily in the first world space, affordability, access, what does it look like? Okay, um, technology, whether we like it or not, is everywhere, so we have to keep up. And it's funny that children, especially from that age of three, four, five, they are very, very conversant with technology. You give them a phone, a tablet, an iPad, they already know how to operate it without you necessarily guiding them. So imagine what now happens when you actually put them through and teach them the right things. I also like to teach my children ICT in school. You know, I have um, a degree in information systems. So when I'm delivering teaching to these children, I don't look at it as, oh, they can't understand what I'm saying. I bring it down to their level. 
if it's in terms of coding, in terms of algorithm, whatever it is, I try to relate it to their daily activities and that way they understand it better. And once they see that, okay, you know, I can use my knowledge of technology in so many other areas, then it makes learning easier for them. And um, whether, even if the children are in a public um, school, I'm sure if they have access to technology, which is another thing, access for some children will be quite difficult when you compare it to the private schools. But government also needs to be able to look at what more can they help to do in terms of providing access. They don't have to provide 100 laptops to all the children at once, even if it's just like one interactive classroom or a VR headset or a laptop, just for them to at least be able to get <coughs> that one access to the, whole, to, to the international world, really. Yeah. I know you're not an economist, but I just wanted to throw some things out there. Because UNESCO has a 15% sort of uh, target for countries, you know, to allocate their budgets every year to education. Nigeria has never met that. Um, I think our current 2024 budget uh, is about 6.39% of the budget goes to education, which is about 1.54 trillion. Of that 1.54 trillion, uh, we have less than 300 billion going to, you know, uh, basic education. Um, does 300 billion look like it can tackle, you know, these issues? It might sound like a huge figure, but considering the constraints, you know, we see all these images of public schools, but before we even talk about the quality infrastructure, you know, in these places, do you think we're ready to start that fight? Uh, I don't think it's enough. You know, definitely I feel a lot more can be allocated to that considering the fact that we see some, you know, amounts being allocated to other, other areas. 300, I don't think it's enough because we're talking about technology, for example. First, we need to look at the hardware and the software. We don't manufacture the laptops, the computers, the phones, the tablets. We need to be able to bring this in. And we all know how, you know, inflation is and the rising cost of dollars and things like that. So if we're allocating that, even just looking at the hardware alone, I don't think that would even be enough. And then when we're talking about software, we have to pay licenses and subscriptions. You know, these are things that we have to consider when we're creating that budget. So just allocating 300 um, to education, there's so many aspects of it. You know, you need to equip the classroom, you need to have the interactive whiteboards, you need to have, you know, the learning environment to be conducive enough, you know. So I think a lot more can be allocated to it. And at the end of the day, when we do allocate it, it's, you know, it's going to come back to benefit us. So why not just, you know, um, plant that in there for the future? We're yeah. not going to be here forever. So let's do what we can to make sure that the future looks good for the ones coming behind us. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for all the work you do. I mean, I, think, I always feel like you people the in the education do, sector and teachers in general never get celebrated enough. So thanks for everything you do. And um, thanks for joining us today. We're going to take a quick break now and we'll be right back. Please stay with us. All right, welcome back now. Let's shift our conversation now to the state of the nation. There's a lot going on, like I said, in the country, uh, besides the fact that the super egos are trying to give us some joy. There's way too much happening, and I have a special guest here with me who I know has a lot to say about this. Shion Kuti, thanks a lot for joining us. My brother, how are you doing? <laughs> Very well, year. thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year <laughs> to you, too. Before we get into the country, I know the Grammys are happening tonight. Yeah. You are a former nominee of the Grammys. Uh, well, I mean, today's one yeah, as well. We are the album well. of the year. Ab with, uh, that's Daniel true. Monet. That's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are you I'm, here? It's not my album, I see. <laughs> you know, but I'm just in the project, and yeah. we want to win, so I'm rooting for her. How do you it's, feel? How do you feel about Africa finally getting a category of its own? Do you think that's patronizing, or do you think it's about time? No, I think you know, as as you know, music is a very social thing. Music is a universal language. Yeah. You know, what me I want to see is um, us also bringing up awards in Africa to that prestige. You know, yeah. Uh, where we all make ourselves available for them. There has to be a time that they all make themselves available for us as well yeah. and put our shows on the, you know, uh, that we don't have to all carry everything that is of value <laughs> from our footballers to our award shows and everything <laughs> to America before it can make sense. <laughs> Africans must enjoy something too, you know. Yeah, it has so, to go both yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you. We're speaking of the fact that Africa has to enjoy some things because <laughs> a lot of them can't come here because of the way things are here. Now, 2024 has started very brutally for a lot of people, almost worse than the way 2023 ended. And that's 
saying something because last year was very, very tough for a lot of Nigerians. You know, you are very outspoken about, you know, the state of the nation. What are your thoughts on where we are? You look at the budget, you look at the president, who's currently not in the country. You know, the insecurity seems to be going crazier by the day. Where do you think things currently are? I think people are not going to like this, but we are in a state of, uh, I think, we don't understand, and I want to again say the word professionals of Nigeria, we don't understand that our talent is not for self-enrichment, it is to develop our nation, and this is where we truly drop the ball, by not engaging our talent, you know, uh, with our national development. Thinking is our national development is some abstract thing that will impact us. We don't understand the stage that we are in nation building, you know. Um, so everything that is happening in Nigeria is tied to the system that we operate in Nigeria. You know, that legally, legally locks out millions of Nigerians from the benefits of their nation. You understand? And if we continue, you know, and Nigerians like to argue about the, you know, our situation is like a train going off the cliff. All of us were in this train and we can see clearly that this train is going off the cliff. But we are arguing about the driver. Oh, uh, this person should drive the train. This person should ride the train. This person will drive the train. This, person, this is the best driver of this train. Nobody is talking about stopping the train. That we've, got, we've got to stop this train and leave this track. Because this track is going off the cliff. That is the only argument that makes sense in Nigeria. Every other thing that people bring, even to the deep, oh, we want our side nation, we want your urban nation, even up to that argument is putting the cart before the horse. You understand? Because even if we want a nation of our own, why aren't the Yoruba elites first of all discussing food security? Before you even announce that you want to be a nation, you must be discussing how you want to feed your people. Where, who, how we grow our pepe? Or is it the Awusa people that want to lock out of our Yoruba, new Yoruba nation that wants to go out export pepper from, I mean import pepper from, you know, these simple questions. So for me, I'm not really, I, I look at Nigeria and I see that the larger issue is that we are still under a neoliberal, capitalist, white-dominated system that we are imposing on our people by force. You know, and we complain when that in system impacts us, meaning dollar is heavy, we can't buy those international goods we like. We can't take these international trips we like. It's more expensive for us to pay our international school fees. These are our expensive private schools and all these things that dollar affects. As if Nigerian people have not been suffering in their millions when dollar was one naira to one dollar. So I just want to get a, get a sense of where you're going with this. Because, yes, I, I think, let me take it back again to last yeah. year. Because I know you did get a lot of talk <laughs> during the elections last year. Um, whether it was the fact that you were supporting the candidate or, the, or not supporting another one, you know. Um, the present government came in with a lot of promises, which we all heard, you know, and a lot of those promises are starting to look like they were just promises, you know. Whether we're talking about the fact that insecurity was going to end, he, Mr. President did say he was going to hit the ground running. He spent a, a bit more time outside the country than he spent here. What is your assessment of those governments in the last, let me say, nine months now, which they've been in power? I'll not only give my assessment now. I'll make prediction, like pastors, for the next four, uh, three and a half, three years and ten months that is left for the administration, <laughs> uh, that uh, nothing much will change for Nigerian people. Things are worse, you know, and nothing more will change for the Nigerian people. Because Why do you think that is? It is okay, it is hidden in plain sight. There's not enough investment by the people in control of the commonwealth of Nigerian people back into Nigerian people. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, let me use something simple so that, like, okay. So let's say you go to school and you study history and you come out of school as a historian. Where's the investment in that field to employ you? It's not going to create itself. When you hear the Smithsonian Museum, when you are hearing all these big cultural art centers in Europe and America, what do you think is paying for it? Do you think it's only it's tax money that is paying for it? Where is the research and development in space travel, space tech? So if you're a robotics engineer, uh, uh, rocket scientist, rocket engineer in Nigeria, what is your hope if you don't run away from the country? Because there's no investment 
That so did you see this before the election? Yes, and that's what I was saying. So you're saying the Mr. President was bound to fail anyways? This is what I was saying before the election, that we are arguing about three candidates that the only thing different was their names. If you look into to, to what they promised Nigerian, it's the same thing that they were going to execute. Whether we like it or not, all the candidates said they were going to remove subsidy. All the candidates said they were going to fix the dollar rate in their own ways. So this is the same because they are confined to anti-African policies. They are confined to these policies and this ideology that cannot move African people forward. They are afraid to take the necessary steps to invest the natural resources that belong to all of us. You know, for example, when they tell you that one billionaire in Nigeria is being given $2 billion by the federal government from the central bank to run his business. Do you think this $2 billion is printed by the central bank? Yes, the dollar coming from. The dollar is coming from our crude oil money that belongs to all Nigerians used to invest in one person's business. They didn't tell me, go and find your dollar in America. Go and create goods that Americans want to buy enough to give you the dollar you need to invest more in your business. No. They take directly from our commonwealth billions of dollars and give these people left, right and center. But they never money for our education, for our health care, for our roads, to invest in human development, in the youth in job opportunities, because everybody wants to be gatekeeper to your existence. You need foil uh, to move around. That's the business they want to do. You need phone to make call. They are there to collect your money. You need house to stay. They own all the land. They are there to be landlord. But those things that mean that a legacy, national development, national investment, they are not there. What do you mean when you say Western-style ideas or what? I'm not remember yeah. the exact term. <laughs> Western-style policies. Policies, yes. yes. What do you mean by that? Am I right in interpreting you saying that our democracy, our democracy doesn't work for us? No, no, it's not an African-centered democracy. It does not put Africa people first. So what, does, what should democracy here look like? Democracy here must be socialistic, first of all, because of the amount of Africans that need to be... Look, let's use China, for example. I like the way China did it. Since if you want to be businessmen, we're going to open a world for the business people, where the business people can be as much business people as they want. But they will, they will never let the businessman's interest interfere in the life of Chinese people. So those things that Chinese people live on, Chinese healthcare, Chinese housing, education, these are all socialized. Nobody can go and pre be predator there and be siphoning life of their people. One day they expanded into factories, building uh, world uh, state-of-the-art tech that their people can use to engage with the world. And now today China, China produces everything. China is making a billionaire every week or something like that, <laughs> you know? So without that kind of mindset here, that understand that people should do business to invest in the development of their people. China has pulled, what, 800 million people out of poverty in the last 10 years. That's four times the size of Nigeria's population. But why isn't it possible that one candidate can go that route. We saw it happen in Brazil as well, through a democracy. Mm. We've seen it to an extent happening in India right now, through a democracy. So can't it happen that same way where someone comes out and sells this idea to you, but yes, I almost feel like in, you would never believe a politician in India, says that. India is, is, is not the same as what they're doing in Brazil. Yes. And if you look at what they're doing in Brazil, also they've been pushed back with Bolsonaro coming in, and now Lula has just come back after they took him to prison. Because you have to understand that we, the professionals, of a country. It is where we lean that the country goes. It is because we are willing to align so much with our oppressors, right, that things are the way they are, that civil servants are willing to take orders as soon as their own families get their benefit through the back door as we all do, lecturers and all the other things they do, policemen and their bribes, bankers and the money laundering, all these things that we are willingly doing, acting as if it doesn't have an impact on millions of people, in the lives of millions of people. So it is we that we have to create this idea and back it up. Because the elites will not do it because they benefit too much from the suffering that's going on in this country. We, the professionals, instead of us to come and pay lip service to our people, as if we are complaining really about what is going on in Nigeria. Because I said, when dollar was one to one, millions of Nigerians were suffering. When fuel was 11 naira, the first time I bought fuel, in my dad's car when I was young, for, it was 11 naira per liter. I saw them, but I could guess it that somebody is buying for it. Millions of Nigeria were still suffering. And people were talking about it then, but nobody cares. So it's more the suffering is touching the things that we exist on that want to act as if, like, mm -mm. 
So now I have to pause. Look at the whole picture. And as Nigerians decide, we really have to make the decision. People so, think it's just a joke. But we have to decide the country that we want. And it is our decision, not any politician or elite. But how does that decision get made? Because whether we like it or not, this is our reality. Yes. We have a democracy that was handed mm -hmm. to us by the military. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the best, but it's what we were handed, right? We're in our 25th or 26th year. I'm not sure exactly the number now. It's going somehow. Yes, faltering a lot. And like you said, the poverty levels are crazy. But it's what we have, right? And we were always presented with this case where it was always two parties. Now there's a third one, or at least there was a third one in the last elections. These are the options Nigerians have. So when you say Nigerians have to, what does that mean? It means that we have to organize outside of the narrative of the elites. These things that concern all of us that do not affect them. I mean, how can somebody whose children are all schooling abroad? You keep who, saying we. Are you not one of the elite? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> my family, we've committed class suicide. <laughs> and it's evident by the burning of our house and the killing of my father's mother in 77. But you were also in it. We were in the elitist group, but they picked us out. <laughs> Long time ago, they've thrown us. I mean, you know, like when you when all those men throw out their wife, it depends on all the neighbors, and you see all the load flying outside. That's how they kicked us out. It was not some secret pushing out. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the truth, though, because certainly Africans are at that stage where we are just we are unlucky because we have elites that are not on our side. We are the only group in the world whose elites are not on our side. They're on the side of the Europeans or the Arabs. You know, so we have to look outside of this narrative and understand how to organize around those things that we care about and be willing to put ourselves forward to build the bridge to our brothers that do not have. We that, last time I came to your show, I said the same thing. We that have been given some comfort within this oppression cannot think that we are special. We are giving it because it's special and it's blessing. No, the reason is to build the bridge to our brothers who have been locked out of the world, locked out of life. Let them know what is going on and organize together to take the political power from this group that don't know what to do with it and use it for the benefit of our people and stand on that promise with them. It should be a camaraderie. We're not doing it because we want to rule them. We're the ones that know best. We want to come and be... Your... We'll pick leaders from them too. We'll educate them. We'll show them the world so they can be leaders too, so they can govern their own communities. This is our task. How is that going to work? Though? We don't know. We've, we've seen that... I don't know if it's the politicians who have done it deliberately, but yeah. we live in a time now where I don't know if we are more divided than ever, but at least in my lifetime, <laughs> this is probably the craziest. Maybe yeah. social media amplifies it a little yeah, too much. Yeah. But we see all of this religious and political yeah. and tribal <laughs> divide so deep now that it's almost impossible to have certain conversations with certain people anymore. So how do you organize that? I, mean, I don't want to talk about the person's religion or tribe. I want to let him know that your child is not going to school, I mean, you can't pay school fees. Me too, I have that same issue. This is what we want to discuss. I have a solution that can solve that. Are you interested in your child eating three square meals a day, going to good school and living in a secure space? I'm sure you want to discuss that regardless of the religion. But isn't that person already suspicious of you? It doesn't matter because it does, it's not only me. We have to build among people like him too. So you have people from his own side to share his own this thing. I don't want to build, I don't want a Yoruba man to impose his own vision on the world on an Igbo man or Igbo man imposing his own. We cannot have minorities in Africa when we are minorities in Europe and America. As I said, this world is what excites me. We have not seen it, but it's our responsibility to create it. We cannot be afraid to imagine that way. We can't be afraid of, oh, we don't know what it will look like. <clears throat> Take the step first. Me, I've been to Aqua Oka in Anambra State to mobilize and organize with people there. And their level of organization and willingness to accept me went far beyond my expectation. I've been to Kaba in Lokoja to organize with people there. And their willingness to accept me and understand and try to deal with me went beyond my expectation. So it is because we haven't taken these steps and we believe in this picture that's been painted of how everybody is just, it's a lie. Could you, could you have had, I mean, because you're saying it to me now yes. in a reasonable way. <laughs> Could you have done that with Peter Okoye from P Square? When you guys had this back and forth on social media, right? Mm -hmm. It looked like a battle. It didn't look like a conversation, which is what I always say about how it boils down to this combativeness every time. Okay. People interpreted it to become a tribal thing <laughs> eventually. But do you feel like that was one of those moments where a conversation could have been had? The personal is not the political. I can build with you politically without having any personal relationship with you. If so was that political or personal? It was personal. Okay. He took the political personal. So I had to respond. Because whatever I said about Peter, I'll be, 
you know, doesn't warrant anybody to respond and call my family and everything into it. So if you think the political is your personal business, okay, let's discuss personally. You know, but I don't have to be friends. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended, exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. That was good. You know, I don't have to be friends with anyone to build with them politically for the benefit of this country. This country is first and foremost. African people come first and foremost in my own existence and imagination and ideology. Yeah. So I don't have to be friends with people to work yeah. with them. Are Even you guys cool now? Have you guys no, talked no, since? No. It's, on, it's on and it's on for laugh. Really? And they say, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't talk to them before. So, so there's no relationship friends, anyways. You know, so there's okay. no... let's, let's move on now to security. Because, yes, the economy is one thing. But then this is a security thing now, which, like I said, Mr. President, did make promises at the time. You know, we've always believed that we had this capacity as the biggest military on the continent, or at least in West Africa. We've <laughs> saved so many countries. Right? And this thing has gone on for decades now. And in the last <laughs> year, or at least in the last couple of months especially, we're starting to see and hear things that are very scary. I mean, not like it wasn't scary before, but the really widespread and daring and brazen and blatant. You know, and people say this might just be the beginning of things. What, what do you see happening there? Well... <laughs> It's two things, really. Uh, but let me discuss the first one. Like, when we say we have the biggest military and they were able to bring peace in Liberia, and the I say, you know, like, we've been conditioned not to respect African people's lives. You know, we, we can hear that 10,000 African people died somewhere. And the whole of Africa will just continue, like, nothing happened. Like, what is that? You know, we have that conditioning. It's something we also have to overcome. So when we say Nigerian army went to bring peace in Liberia, do you see the methods? that they used <laughs> to bring this peace. <laughs> so, I don't think Nigerians want these methods to be applied on our own soil. And this is kind of what is hindering the Nigerian army as well, that they cannot go in and do the Nigerian army, like Zaki Biam and Odi. You know, they tell it to Nigeria, like, this insecurity, you know, it started in Bielsa one time, Nigerian army went there, and Nigerian army there, Zaki Biam, other ambassador, you know, it's almost genocidal. You know what I'm saying? Like wiping out a whole community because of the actions of a few, like what Israel is doing in, in Gaza right now. You know, I don't think we want such, such actions to be taken. So like everybody's, the issue with insecurity in Nigeria is tied down to the fact that there's mass poverty. We cannot deny that it is the poverty in the land and the lack of opportunities. And not only the lack of opportunities, they're in the midst of all that opportunity. The children of all these rich people are just throwing their wealth in the face of all these poor people, using it to talk down on them. Ah, come on, something's got to give. Do you think Mr. President has the capacity to fix it? Nigeria doesn't have the capacity to fix it. In this current system that we operate, we have 200 million people. How many people are in the military? How many people are in the police, really? Can the police really employ the amount of personnel that they need to... If you have issue in your house, okay, you know, we, we big boys for Lagos. Our policeman number, they have our phone. Anything, have a wah, But to those that don't have such number, how do they get help? You're on your own, really. In Ojolomo Oto, in your Yoruba, say, we're picking, owner of picking, I know rich. You're on your own. You know, so let us not act like it is based on some certain mystery that there's insecurity in the land. There's insecurity in the land because there's no investment in the security apparatus of the land. Case closed. Case closed. The investment needed has been used. The Air Force jet we should buy is somebody's private jet. The police car we should be buying is somebody's personal car in his compound. All the police employees we should be employed to serve the people are somebody's thugs and touts. You know, guiding their house and helping them do election. Anyway. Hey. What do you think of uh, one of the funny stories yeah. I'll tell you also about insecurity? is the story of Ken Inwega, really, about the OD massacre. Ken, according to Karl Mayer, who was an American-German journalist that wrote the book, This House Has Fallen. And in his book, he claims that Ken Inwega was one of Ali Miseha's lieutenants. And he was the one, after the election, that there was no work, was robbing people on the highway, and was really brutal. He now killed nine policemen. So Obasanjo called Ali Miseha to arrest him in Yanagua.
Obasanjo didn't want, uh, Alun didn't want to arrest him because now he guy. Obasanjo had declared state of emergency in Bayosa State. Ken ran to his town in Odi. That's how Obasanjo sent army people there to meet him. Now, according to Kamaya, if we say that this report is true because nobody has sued Kamaya till today for libel, nobody has sued him. Well, I'm not, so, I'll not be surprised if after this order somebody comes to sue me. Say, she will say, as if I'm the one that wrote the book. I, I'm telling you, I can't, I can't tell you, I'm in court right now, I can't even begin to talk how crazy this country is. Yes, she's views are not <laughs> the views of Robin Mike. Hey, Kamaya's views in his book are not the views of Shewari Kabukuti. I'm just saying what I read, you know, and that nobody has countered it. I've not read any article to uh, refute his claims. You understand? In that book, this house has fallen. You know, uh, nobody has refuted that. So if that is true and nobody has refuted it, that means the direct link between these people causing this crime and politicians also. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on this because I, I like to go back to what our reality is, yes. whether we like it or not. And I just, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the fact that this is happening. We've had a very tough start to the year. January, insecurity and all of that. Mr. President is not in the country. He's on a private visit to France. That's what he told us. We don't know what a private visit means. He's hardly a president. He has gone to visit issues. Macron. So, yeah. what, 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 what do you, you think I know about what, a private what this picture means? Like? A private visit means he has gone to see Macron for his private personal business. Uh, let the man. <laughs> see, one thing I know is this, as I said, until we have leaders that are dedicated, you know, whose children are all Nigerians. Yes, you people have. Let's call all the governors and presidents of Nigeria. Let's bring all their children. Let them present their passports. <laughs> yes. You, you, father of foreigner, you tell them you, you want to give my own child a future. But your own children are all foreigners. But you are building a future for my children. So it's these little things that we used to know what is true and what is not true, you know, about what's going on in this country. We as the people, we must be the ones to do the work. That's just it. Many of these neighborhoods that have been attacked is simple displacement. It's the same technique they are using in the Congo. When they, you don't know, they have all these technologies that are beaming into the ground now, that, you know, electromagnetic uh, poles going into the ground, knowing what is in the ground, scanning back images. You are living on billions. You don't know that there are billions, trillions of dollars flowing under your leg. You are just a common villager going to your farm every day, living your simple life. Don't know some multinational billionaire from one country, don't they plan your downfall? Calling guys, they arrange. Brrr, they're blaming Africans and barbarians attacking them. Say, clear that neighborhood. You know, what is one of the best ways to make poor people move? You destroy the schools. Boko Haram attacking schools. When a poor man knows his child cannot go to school, he will leave that area. Because education for all poor people, for them, is the way out. They believe education is the way out for their children. So if you attack schools, that was a great tactic for people that were grabbing resources and land. Because you know, that is what is really going on in this country. Let's face facts. You know, it is the people with arms in this country that have access to arms in this country, you know, that are able to do these kind of things. And this displacement of these people, I'm telling you, is for... Uh, natural resources reason to begin to exploit those areas where they need those villagers to move out of their ancestral land. That's what I believe personally. On that very grim note, <laughs> you have come here and just told us that we're going to suffer for the next three and a half years. No, no, I'm just saying <laughs> we're not going to suffer. We are going to organize for the next three and a half years. We have to look at the right thing to do. If we're going to suffer, it means we have resolved that we're not going to do anything about it. We can't end like that. We have to say for the next three and a half years, we professionals of Nigeria want to organize on behalf of our people and build this bridge and be their representation, bring a new narrative to them. With this narrative, trust me, some people are going to go drop all these kidnapping jobs when other people give. They say, oh, more forget. We are moving with MOP. We see the light. <laughs> I get you. Before we go very quickly now, just take a look at 2024. For you personally now, yeah. I mean, let's end on a bit of a bright note. <laughs> I mean, congratulations again on the Grammys. Hope you win it today. Yeah. Um, but I mean, what's your plans for the year? Uh, my Especially album, music -wise. My first album in five years is out this year. Uh, oh, really? When? Uh... I don't know, any time from... Because if you give us a date, now you have to stick no, to I it. No, I can't give a date yet. I can't give it, I'm not even going, I'm not... Third I quarter? finished recording. No. We can't do first quarter anymore, but second quarter, for okay. sure. We're going to do first quarter, but this whole award season has tied up my producer. Okay. So we haven't been able to finish. Lenny Kravitz is my producer, by the way. I'm not oh. just trying to drop names of... Bra you know? Really? Yeah, he's my friend, you know. Zoe Kravitz's dad. I don't know if you know him. 
Yes. Uh, <laughs> so we're working together on the prayer. And this award season has kind of slowed us down. And um, once we're done with this whole season, because he has a lot of things to do, we'll finish the project. Yeah, I have yeah, my tours, uh, quite a few things that I can't even talk about yet because we've not really finished signing off on them. But 2024, you know, is a step in the right direction. Yeah. Are you finally accepting of Afro beats? I've always accepted Afro beats. Yeah. You know, but what I've said is that I don't like that people think it is an extension or a you replacement think they are two separate of things. Afrobeat. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah, well, But it, it's it can, there's it, enough it's evidence same, that it it's influenced same, a lot of it's things. It's from the same tree. It's just a different branch. Okay. You know, and I think Afrobeat has achieved enough in the world today for it to be able Stand to confidently its beat its chest and say, yeah, we've been able to make African pop music. Yeah. Why can't we embrace that? Any Afrobeat artists on your new project? On my new project, uh, that you can tell us, P Square. Uh, I don't know. That would be great. Maybe I'll ask them. That would actually be. They'll do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you for having us, and uh, I wish you all the best with everything. Oh, always okay. good to see oh, you here. No, 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 man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we'll take a very quick break. I will be right back. Please stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back. Yes, that was a very tough <laughs> segment to swallow. And, I mean, I guess reality bites sometimes. But let's end today's show talking about a few of the things that, you know, make Nigerians smile in very, very hard times. We started, of course, the show talking about sports and, you know, wishing the Super Eagles all the best on Wednesday. We're not try for us. In South Africa, not drag, <laughs> drag our lives. But let's talk uh, entertainment. And I'm joined now here by Rex Moses, who's a media printer. Thanks a lot for being here today. Thank you, Luca. Um, the Grammys are happening in a few hours tonight. Yeah. We have so many artists nominated. Davido Burner Boys, oh, yeah. Ira Star, yeah. Ashake, Olamide, yeah, yeah. um, Fireboy, yeah. I believe, uh, Shin Kutu, who just yeah. left. Yeah. So yeah. it's becoming sort of the norm now. Mm -hmm. Grammy is now like uh, one of our, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, what are your expectations this evening? And who are you tipping <laughs> to bring these things home? Okay, so so, so um, to begin with, I mean, uh, kudos to all the nominees. I mean, this is very great, uh, you know, uh, so many Nigerians, and then this is huge for the music space. Um, Afrobeat has come to stay. Uh, and then the world cannot deny how impactful the Afrobeat sound has been. Yeah. So this is actually good. Us getting recognition, and uh, I believe it will even grow from here. Uh, probably next year, maybe 20 of Nigerian artists <laughs> will be nominated. Yeah. But having said that, I, I'm not going to pick any favorite because a couple of them are all my guys. So, but um, I believe uh, for any of them uh, that might win tonight, uh, is, they, they deserve it. Yeah. They deserve it. All the nominees, they deserve it. So any one of them that win, a win for one is a win for all at the yeah. end of the day. Same question I asked you, well, let me ask you. Do you think having an African category yes. is a sign of growth for Afrobeats or they're just patronizing us? Uh, I, I, I think... Um, because, I mean, why not put us in the mainstream in, category? Uh, right? The thing is, I, I believe, is one step at a time. Yeah. Um, and then I, I want to look at it from another angle. You know, there's this popular saying that uh, JJ Okocha was so good, they have to name him twice. JJ. <laughs> so probably we are so special, they have to create our own special category. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take that. Yeah. Let's move on now to Hollywood. And, you know, um, the last couple of years have looked very exciting, yeah. you know, for, you know, what's happening with... Um, especially what streaming has brought mm -hmm. to change the game. Yeah. Uh, that, of course, at the end of last year into the beginning of this year, Funky Akidele smashed, you know, what looked undoable, mm. you know, for years. Crossed the one billion naira mark, yeah. finally. Yeah. And I set the pace now for what cinemas might look like in the coming months. Yeah. Um, are, are we still excited about, you know, where Hollywood is going? Because, you know, it looked like streaming was coming to shake things up. Now it looks like cinema is, you know, still has, has that foothold on yeah. things. You know, what do you think 2024 is going to look like for that space? Okay, so uh, congrats to Funke Akidele hitting the one billion mark. And uh, this is exciting. It's good. Two years ago, I did a pitch for a blockbuster uh, movie uh, I'm going to produce uh, later this year. And when I was, giving, when I was uh, presenting the pitch to one of the executive producers, and then I projected... It is possible to do a billion. The question was, how? Is it even possible? Do Nigeria still go to cinemas? And then two years after, it happened. And then I'm like, yes. So what this means, to be, you know, to, to, firstly, is to all filmmakers out there now, this is possible. To investors, 
it is actually possible. Yes, Nigerians still visit the cinema. They still go to you know they do still go to cinemas to see movie aside um, the usual streaming platform because right now everybody wants everything at their fingertips, not wanting to go anywhere. But I, I feel you know the movie was so nice and then the marketing and then the PR was so good. People just had to see for themselves, you know, which is fantastic. So this is encouraging, you know, and I believe for 2024, um, we might not get a movie that will do a, a billion this year, but I believe within two to three years, we'll get a movie that will probably do about two billion. Yeah. Yeah. But so as, as we get excited about streaming and cinemas, yeah. there's also a lot of downsides, right? True. I mean, first of all, let's talk about Malaika, mm. uh, which was uh, produced by Tony Abraham, who puts in blood, sweat, and money yeah. into producing this. I think yeah. she said it got because of about 500 million naira to yeah. do or put that movie together. Was doing very well in the mm -hmm. cinemas, and then we suddenly saw a video of her with some perpetrators who she accused of, you know, pirating her movie and sharing it across mm -hmm. social media platforms. That is still a reality for a lot of people. Sure. You know, uh, how are we going to start having that or starting that battle? Mm. Because we thought it was something that had died with the DVD era, but it's still there, isn't mm -hmm. it? So, um, you see, from the era of the tapes to the CD, we had piracy. And right now we're in the digital era, we still have piracy. So I feel um, the regulatory bodies, they might be doing well, but they are not doing enough. The Nigerian uh, uh, Copyright Commission, they are not doing enough. It's not just to have regulations. How effective are these regulations? Somebody will not cough out blood and sweat into making a film and will not even be able to make recover his or her money back. It is not actually, it, it is not good because if you go to an investor to take fund to making a movie and that movie is not even able to generate uh, a 50% uh, profit, there is no way that investor would want to come back yeah. and then to drop down another uh, money. So I, I believe for uh, Toyin Bram, you know, it was a good move taking, um, taking that step. And uh, some people on Twitter were tweeting, you know, it was for a selfish reason, she is doing this for herself. This, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I think to me, I mean, Nobody would cough out that kind of money and would not actually want to, you know, uh, want to uh, take the fight out there. Yeah, I mean, I, and anybody, sorry, sorry yeah, to question you, because yeah. anybody who's saying it was selfish reasons, because even a trap gold Judah also, also got leaked, got, got on, leaked the, the, on Telegram. The Telegram. It yeah. happens to a lot of people who now yeah. release. And, you know, unfortunately, we saw Prime Video, you mm -hmm. know, saying they were leaving the continent yeah. with regards yeah. to producing original content. They are still yeah. here. Yes. They are still in Nigeria. Yeah. Their streaming platform still exists mm -hmm. here, but they are cutting back on producing original content because you put these things out and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Two days later, it's being it shared in a file, yes, and yeah. you can't blame a lot of people because investments are huge. True. So, is that it worries me for the industry? True. Um, so, so the, the thing is, this is that in that regard, uh, I feel aside the issue of piracy, um, uh, competition as well, because aside Amazon, we also know for Netflix as well. You know, yeah. they are also, they are even promoting original content. They want more original um, uh, content on their platform. So, I, I feel aside piracy, competition might be another reason why Amazon Prime wants to cut out funding. And another thing is this is, all right, for filmmaking, um, some of times, sometimes, it might, not, you might not, it might not generate instant profit, you know, sometimes. So you have to look at that. And every business has its downside too, not only uh, filmmaking or content creation. Other businesses also have their downside. Yes, it's worrisome, but I believe um, streaming platforms um, we have uh, Directors Guild of Nigeria. We have uh, Association of Producers in Nigeria. I believe everybody needs to come together right now to yeah. take steps. Um, we, ha we used to have task force in those days, going to, from shop to shop, going to Alaba to clamp down. Yeah, but people. technology has made it hard to find the shop. To, so the thing <laughs> is this right now. So streaming pl platforms coming together, um, individual, you know, and then other bodies coming together, I believe we can actually tackle this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But only know before we go very quickly, are yeah. you still excited about 2024 entertainment wise? Yeah, oh, because yes. Because last year was pretty good. Yes, yes, um, obviously. Uh, 2024, um, I believe there are, some, there are some year. history, there are some history, you know, that, um, that we are going to, there are some record we are going to break this year, obviously. Um, I see some movies doing crazy numbers. I mean, the, the, the Black Book yeah. uh, on Netflix did amazing numbers um, globally. And then I, I know a couple of movies this year are still going to even do better than last year, obviously. We can only hope for. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us today. I mean, Thank you. if it's the one thing that's working in the country, may it continue to work. <laughs> <laughs> but like I always say, you can follow the conversation on social media. Please use the hashtag grab in mind when you send us a message. My name is Abu Kao Buchendo, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>